Greetings, programs. This is Wretch, and welcome back to Starship Traveler. In the last episode, our ship headed into a black hole, and we found ourselves in an alternate universe, and now we're struggling to get ourselves home. We did a little bit of exploring, and we went to a planet with the purple star, and things ended very badly for us. So we used a bookmark, and we're back here. Now, we can head to the double star, or try for the purple star again. And I think for the purposes of this playthrough, we're just going to keep on seeing if we can find solutions to where we've gone. And we'll only head to the other location if there's absolutely no way to win. So we'll head for the purple star. And we'll beam down like we did before. Now, we know these guys are immune to phaser fire. So I don't think... I think who we had originally, which are, was Zarg, our science officer and medical officer muscles, that still cracks me up, we will be good for this, so we'll go ahead and beam down and as we remember from the last episode, these guys are uh, patrolling the streets, we follow the creature into this one of the small buildings and then we get caught and our friend gets blasted and now the penalty is extermination, enter this vehicle you know, so, draw phasers and fire is probably a bad idea, so let's pretend to comply and then take them by surprise, and we'll see what happens. You walk up to the entrance door as if to climb into the vehicle. As you pass by the aliens, you signal to the others, and the three of you spring on them. This proves to be a rather fruitless exercise, as the three creatures are immensely strong. They fling you to the ground, but as you fall, you manage to grab the helmet off one of the aliens stops dead in its tracks in a very artificial pose, as if some switch had suddenly turned it off. The leader grabs the helmet and replaces it on his colleague, who instantly springs back to life. He realize you'll be no match for the creatures. Climb into their vehicle as they ordered? Okay, so the helmets are apparently key. As you enter the vehicle, it rocks from side to side. Your captors climb in and start the hover engine, swinging the car around the way it came. You travel for half an hour or so and finally stop outside a large round building. Other similar cars have stopped there as well and numerous aliens are being led into the building. You're taken inside and put into a room which is evidently a cell of some kind, along with four aliens. They seem resigned to the fact that they are about to be exterminated as part of a population control program. You can understand why they are so unemotional about their impending death. One of the uniformed creatures calls for your party. You'll have to act quickly. Will you try to fight your way out, try to contact the ship, or try to arrange to see someone in authority? Let's try and contact the ship first, since I don't think fighting is particularly wise. You try your communicator, but can hear only static. Something in the building is jamming your signal. However, as you try the controls, you notice something strange. All the aliens you can see are motionless, like statues. You have discovered what may be a way of escape. You turn off your communicator, and the aliens come back to life. Following the guard, you turn down another corridor which leads to large open room. Various armored guards seem to be directing civilians through a large open doorway at one end of the room from which, you were, from which a dull red glow is coming. You are directed to the end of the line. Use your previous discovery to escape, obey the aliens, and get in line. Let's ask our science officer for advice since we brought him on the team. Turning to science officer Zarg, you ask if they have any ideas on what to do. Your discovery that pulling the helmets off the PCs causes them to freeze will be helpful here. As a result, Science Officer Zarg has an additional two skill points added to their science skill for this roll. You must roll equal or lower than Zarg's skill of 12 to succeed. Awesome! Just So we got it. You definitely passed the skill check. I'm glad we brought Zarg along. Science Officer Zarg has been observing the aliens and knows that something is strange and not quite natural about them. They believe that these creatures may not be creatures at all, that in fact you are on a planet controlled by androids, artificially manufactured robots made to reassemble or made to resemble living creatures. Zarg suggests you try set, setting your communicator to a jamming frequency, which you do. To your surprise, all the aliens in the room are suddenly frozen, as if time is standing still. While they are all transfixed, you quickly leave the room. Well, that's handy. You head for the center of the complex, dodging around the corridor so as to avoid the creatures. You try your communicator several times to reach the ship, but something is jamming the signal. You pass one room in which the walls are covered with electronic equipment. Perhaps this is the transmission room, transmitting the signal which is blocking your own signal to the ship. Two aliens sit inside, but your attempts to con contact the ship on your own communicator have turned them into statues. This is cool. 
Entering the room, you play with controls until eventually, a signal comes back through your communicator from the ship. You give the order to beam up straight away. It will take several seconds to fix on your exact coordinates, and while you wait, you remove one of the alien's helmets. Inside the helmet and the creature's head is a mass of electronic circuitry. You have been captured by androids. You keep the helmet for investigation on the ship, and moments later, the transmatter beam locks on to take you up. Ooh, do you like my hat? Sport the latest in android-based fashion. Medical Officer Muscles tends to the wounded on board the ship. Two stamina are restored to any injured crew members. The electronics lab reports that the helmet you brought back was indeed an advanced piece of work. With a few adjustments, they'll be able to prepare it so that, when you wear it, you increase your skill by one point. This will undoubtedly be useful. Alright. Leaving orbit, you scan space ahead of you. There's a planet ahead some 3.6 light years away, which may support life. You enter warp speed and head towards it. So, let's go ahead and bookmark that. You approach a medium-sized blue-green planet and take up orbit position. Scanning the planet's surface reveals several clusters of intelligent life forms. You try to contact them, but nothing comes up on the radio. What are your orders, Captain? <laughs> Beam down. Always. Assemble your crew for the medium-sized blue-green planet with potentially several clusters of intelligent life forms. Let's get Zarg again. Muscles. And we can bring someone else. Good. Let's bring Security Officer Drake. The engineering Officer never really leaves the ship, at least in Star Trek. When you have made your selection, continue down to the planet. Oh dear. You land on the planet and look around. A thunderstorm is raging around you and is pouring with rain. You are standing on rocky ground about a hundred meters from what appears to be a village of some kind. Three aliens, presumably villagers, are shuffling around about halfway to the village, but as you appear, they are startled and turn to face you. They are strange, podgy creatures with long necks and stumpy legs. One of the aliens turns and waddles off back to the village at what must be a running pace. The other two are advancing towards you with weapons, long pointed sticks drawn. Um, let's walk towards them and meet them. No, let's not even appear that we're being, um, aggressive in any way. Let's wait for the villains to, er, villains, Peridian, the aliens to arrive. Through your translator, you talk to them, explaining your mission. They are suspicious and hold you at bay with their weapons, but agree to take you to the village elder to talk. As you enter the village area, other aliens shuffle towards you inquisitively. You are marched to a large hut in the center of the clearing to meet the village elder. You enter this hut and see a large, somewhat wrinkled alien squatting in a far corner. After you exchange introductions, you begin to question him. Well, let's ask him about the planet and its inhabitants first. The alien is quite a talkative creature and tells you that you are on the planet Kliba. On the surface of the planet, there are many villages of similar creatures. Their stage of cultural development seems to be approximate with that of the Middle Ages on Earth. They are an agricultural race. The weather on the planet used to be excellent, but bad weather has ruined the crops for several seasons. The weather is controlled by someone they refer to as the Rain Lord, who lives in a fortified castle two hours' journey from their village. The Rain Lord is, they believe, punishing them with this bad weather. As the crops have been fought failing, the village has been hit by famine and disease. If you have your medical officer with you, you may offer to see what can be done for the sick. You can ask them whether they have any knowledge of astronomy, or you can offer to try and contact the Rain Lord. Let's see what uh, Medical Officer Muscles has to offer. Medical Officer Muscles is taken round to some of the huts to see whether anything can be done. You must roll equal or lower to the medical skill of 11. That'll do it. Conditions are very primitive. Medical Officer Muscle notices that many of the aliens have a fever and tries a drug which appears to bring their fever down. The aliens are grateful for your help. Let's explore the village some more. Medical Officer Muscle's returns and complains of feeling unwell. Oh crap. Let's... Let's put in a bookmark here. Test our luck. We gotta get nine... Or lower. That's not nine. That's eleven. Uh-oh. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just use the bookmark here because I don't want to lose my medical officer. There we go. I am lucky, quote unquote. The feeling soon passes and medical officer muscles recovers after a brief rest. Now discuss what to do next. You may now either return to the ship or continue your voyage or offer to contact their rain lord to see if you can help them with their weather problem. Let's contact the rain lord. Let's see if we can do some good. 
Following their directions, you head toward the hills to visit the Rainlord's castle. After some 15 minutes walk, you see a large building in the distance and it takes you another 15 minutes to reach it. Evidently, a walk which takes you half an hour would take the aliens much longer at their sluggish pace. You reach the gate and can see an armed guard barring the way. Well, let's see exactly what's going on here with this Rain Lord. Let's continue up the gate and talk to the guard. The guard sees you and flurries into action. Raising its head in the air, it lets out a shrill whistle. Seconds later, you look up and see that you are surrounded by alien guards, all with weapons pointed at you. Eww. Okay. You are escorted into the castle towards a central keep, apparently the nerve center of the castle. You explain that you wish to meet the Rain Lord. One of the guards goes off to the keep and comes back some moments later. Another group of guards comes over to take you inside the keep. Hello. As you enter, your eyes widen. You are not in the great hall, or perhaps stateroom, you had been expecting, but in a large computer complex. The walls are lined with sophisticated control panels covered in gauges, dials, and indicator lights. In the center of the room, behind a large screen flanked with a number of keyboards, sits a human figure. As you approach, this figure turns around in his chair. Let's speak to the host. No rain, no pain. Have mercy on the Rain Lord's guards. Aha! Our intruders, chuckles the small man sitting on the controls. Perhaps you may be able to help with our little problem. But firstly, I thank you for your peaceful approach. Please accept this small token of my gratitude. It gives you a strange triangular crystal device. This transdimensional compass may be of use, not enough to say guide a starship, but useful for a single person, and may prove useful. The man himself, or the man calls himself Bronsell. You introduce yourselves and tell him your story. I may be able to help Captain Joel Robinson, says Bronsell, if you're able to help me first. He goes on to explain that many years ago, he was an interstellar trader, carrying a cargo of sophisticated planet control computers to Galena 3 in another sector of the galaxy. His warp drive failed and he was forced into orbit around this planet. He was able to contact Glena 3 to explain the delay, but they would take no excuses and cancel the order. Thus he was left with his cargo and no buyer. Facing financial ruin if he returned home, he decided to settle on the planet. Through his advanced knowledge, he was quickly hailed as a sort of god by the inhabitants, who built him a castle in which he could set up his planet-controlled equipment. Since then he has indeed acted as a god and, by his own account, a benevolent one at that. However, some time ago he discovered a malfunction in the weather planning system which meant he could no longer ha that he no longer had control over the weather. As the climate was normally very damp, the years of fine weather he had provided for the benefit of the inhabitants' crops had resulted in huge reserves of rain being stored in the planet's clouds. As soon as control was lost, a torrential downpour started. If you have knowledge of planet control systems, you can help me get back control of the weather. I'm sure the computer's knowledge of astronomy will be able to help you get back to your own universe, promises the little man. Well, Science Officer Zarg accompanied us, so... Scrutinizing the planet's control system, Science Officer Zarg studies the complex programming of the strange machinery. Hopefully they'll be able to restore the planet's weather back to normal. So, we have to roll equal or lower to Zarg's science skill of 10. I wonder if this would have been better had we brought the engineering officer aboard. So, 10 or lower. I'll take it. Science Officer Zarg takes a dump of the weather control program back to the ship to try and analyze this on the ship's computer. It's been written in a strange language, but the computer is able to give some insight into its logic patterns. Zarg alters it slightly and runs the modified program. Within a few moments, the rain dies down. Rancel is delighted and offers to use his computer to search for a suitable black hole to transport you back to his own to your own universe. The computer locates several such black holes. Fortunately, it cannot distinguish between them, but is able to tell you that you will have to travel towards it at a warp speed 3 to effect the transfer successfully. You thank Broncel for your help. For his help. That's cool, so we know the speed we have to take. And we'll beam up. So, we've helped out the natives and helped out the Rain Lord and didn't kill anyone, so... Let's go ahead and put a bookmark in there. You leave orbit and probe with your scanners for likely destinations. Some 3.3 light years away is a large red planet which you can head towards. Medical officer muscles tends to the wounded on board the ship, and two stamina restored to any injured crew members. You switch to warp drive and head towards the red planet. As you reduce from warp speed, you approach a small, gray planet. Huh. Well, let's enter orbit around it. We'll explore all the things. The planet appears to have no life on it, but scanners detect some sort of activity. Perhaps the regular workings of a machine. Looks like a shipwreck. 
You decide to investigate and send out a party and recon plane to see what is happening. They pilot the plane to the area of the signal and land on the planet. It is rocky and barren, but not far from where they have landed, they find a scout ship of a type they have never come across before. Crash into the surface. Yeah, let's investigate it further. They can find known signs of the pilot. Perhaps he has died or was killed in the crash. An automatic signal, probably a type of mayday call, is being transmitted by the ship's radio. There being nothing else to see on the planet, your crew return to the recon plane and fly back to the ship. Oh. Okay. Landing the recon plane, the party make their way to the briefing room to report to you. As to relate their findings, you are interrupted suddenly with an urgent message. Captain, we've lost three of our engineering personnel who were involved with docking the recon plane. They're all dead. Ooh. Um. Okay. Put the landing party into quarantine in the medical section. Seal off the docking bay. Jettison the recon. Let's seal off the docking bay. Quickly, the crew seal off the affected area so as to prevent the spread of this unknown killer. No more deaths are reported. Let's consult with the medical team. Using an EVA, extravehicular activity suit. Hey! A medical officer muscle examines the body of one of the victims. They find that the man has been poisoned. The planet below must have had some sort of poisonous gas in its atmosphere, and this has now been carried back to the ship. What now, Captain? Um... Order the medical officer to search for an antidote, indeed. You wait impatiently for medical officer muscles to return from the medical section. Hopefully they'll be able to succeed in creating an antidote for the crew. So, 11 or lower? Huzzah! Medical Officer Muscles comes up with a possible antidote and ejects themselves. They go down to the docking bay without an EVA suit and wait. An hour later, they have still so shown no signs of illness. The antidote is working. Report to the medical section for treatment? Indeed. Now, let's see here. Oh, I have to cough. One second. Okay. Sorry. I'm getting over being sick, so... Back on the bridge, you set your course. Ahead of you are two planets. Set course for the large red planet, a blue planet, or a small, fast-moving spot with signs of life. Well, we were heading to the red planet, so let's go ahead and continue that way. That sucks that we lost some folk, though. You set the ship in orbit around the large red planet. Your scanners indicate an intelligent, dominant species on the planet, and you try to communicate with them. After some time, you establish radio contact with a being who, who identifies himself as Commander Dom, head of the Space Navy of the planet Darville. His image flickers up on the screen. He is humanoid in shape, although somewhat grotesque by Earth standards. You estimate his height as over two meters, and his craggy face gives you the impression that his race is somewhat aggressive. Nevertheless, he invites you and two other crew members to be down to meet him. Well, this is probably going to be bad, but let's go ahead and drop the bookmark so we know what to do, and beam down. Assemble your crew to visit planet Darville. Pick two crew members to accompany you to the planet's surface. Well, if these guys are aggressive... I'll tell you what, let's go with Security Officer Drake and Security Officer Griff. Let's make a show of strength, I guess. Let's beam down. You set transmatter coordinates for... Oh, these guys aren't that bad. Navy Headquarters, as instructed by Commander Dom. Your party dematerializes in the ship and rematerializes again on the planet. You look around for your new, sur er, your new surroundings to find you are in a military reconnaissance room of some sort. Armed guards stand by the door. In front of you stands Commander Dom. Your crew are also surveying the room, but they seem to be searching for something. You announce your introduction to... Do you have your science officer Zarg with you? Of course, I knew it. Sorry, I just saw that. I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, <laughs> Get Zarg to come along with me. Maybe Zarg and Drake. Okay. So we enter orbit around the planet. Oh, we're back here. I thought we had had a... Oh, there we go. That's the one to use. Okay, let's beam down. Let's get Zarg with us. And Drake, since these guys are aggressive. Now we'll beam down. You announce your introduction to the Dar of Villains, and everyone in the room stares at you in disbelief. Your own crew are looking at you with astonished expressions on their faces. You cannot feel a little strange, but cannot understand their reaction until you look down at yourself. Your body is that of a Dar Villain. You are tall and thick-set, and in full military dress. Do you have Science Officer Zarg with you? Yes. Science Officer Zarg speaks to Commander Dom. As they do, you realize the full implication of what has happened. 
You also feel turmoil going on inside you. You question what has happened, but your voice is that of a dar villain and a powerful, aggressive feeling. Part hatred, part panic overcomes you. Science Officer Zark begins to explain that there's been a malfunction during the teleportation process. So we need to roll... Um, equal or lower than Zarg's science skill of 10. Ah! There we go. I love that little dice, uh, cheat. Science Officer Zarg suggests that you have been beamed down to the exact coordinates where one of the Dar Villain officers was standing and that your bodies have merged. Both the Commander and Zarg agree that a solution must be found to separate the two individuals once more. Holy crap! Um, Science Officer Zarg suggests that you all return to the ship and run a situation analysis through the ship's computer. They try to convince the Darvillian commander to also come with you. However, Zarg's lack of leadership skill is apparent, and the commander is suspicious. So, ten or lower? Cool. Your senior officer flicks their communicator and instructs the traveler to beam the crew members, Commander Dom and you, back aboard. On the ship, Science Officer Zarg runs an analysis of the situation through the ship's computer. It indicates that you were beamed down to the exact coordinates of one of the Darvillan guards, and so your body appears inside his. Medical Officer Muscles tends to the wounded on board the ship, and two stamina are restored. You must now decide how you will separate yourself. Um, Let's ask Science Officer for their opinion. Zarg hasn't failed us yet. Turning to Science Officer Zarg, you ask how they can have any idea, or if they have any ideas on how they can separate your mind from the Darvillan's body you are currently merged with. So, ten or lower? Science Officer Zarg suggests that since you have your mind inside a Darvillan's body, there must be somewhere a Darvillan mind inside your body. Perhaps if you repeat the journey through the transmatter unit to the same place, you will discover the whereabouts of this other body. Alright, let's go ahead and follow that advice. You step into the transmatter unit and beam down to Darville. You arrive in the same state. The experiment has not worked, and you have yourself beamed up again. Oh, that sucks. Um, let's ask the ship's computer. The computer suggests you have an engineering officer, Faust, rig up a genetic filter for the transmatter machine. Genetic filters are used in conjunction with transmatter devices in experimental genetics. When scientists wish to combine the features of two or more animals or plants to see what the resulting hybrid would be, they often use transmatter devices, or, or transmitter devices. If they wish to separate the result, resulting hybrid back again, they do so with a genetic filter which analyzes the cellular makeup of an organism passing through the transmitter machine and separates the hybrid into its components. However, genetic filters are at an experimental stage only, often the results have been unexpected. So, let's go ahead and do that. You decide that the best course of action would be to construct a genetic filter to manually separate the Dar villain's body from your own. You discuss the complexity of this with engineering officer Faust, and they express confidence that they can roll such a machine. Or they can build such a machine. Roll two dice. So, oh, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to add a bookmark. There we go. Equal or lower to the engineering skill of eight. He has a low engineering skill. But we made it. Engineering Officer Faust sets to work. It will take their department some time to rig up a genetic filter. Two hours later, they bleep you to tell you that the device is ready for testing. You make your way to their lab to try it out. Inside the lab stands an M-shaped machine positioned over three mattresses. You lie down on the middle mattress and the filter is turned on. Above you, a red light glows and a dull humming noise pitches or increases in pitch. Eight or less... Whoa! I roll. Oh, I rolled a nine. Hold on. Let's go back. I don't trust luck rolls. So eight or better for Faust. Now let's test our luck again. There we go. As the red light becomes brighter and the humming pitch increases, you begin to feel warm. Suddenly, Engineering Officer Faust, who has been watching the indicators on the device's control panel, hits a red button. They apologize, explaining that the screening element seems to have overheated and they cannot risk sending you through the filter. They return to their lab to work on another screen. Okay, got nothing to do but wait. Engineering Officer Faust disappears to their lab and sets to work. An hour later, they bleep you. They have tried different types of screening devices in the filter, but cannot make one work. Well, we've already asked Zarg. Let's see what the villain has to say. 
The dark villain commander uses a device on his wrist to contact his headquarters. Over several minutes, he speaks to various members of his personnel. Finally, one of them evidently has a good idea. The commander turns to you. Since your two bodies were combined by a transmatter beam, he reasons. It seems logical that you should be separated in the same way, Captain Joel Robinson. His idea is to focus two transmatter beams on your coordinates, one being the traveler and the other form from his own headquarters at exactly the same time. They should separate your two selves, hopefully into their two original identities. Okay, well, that's pretty much it. Let's do this. Well, let's bookmark. We can ask Zarg for suggestions, apparently. Um... Turning to ask if you have any ideas how to like, separate your mind. Okay, so it just goes back to what Zarg originally suggested. So we're going to go ahead and go with uh, this idea. <coughs> Excuse me. As the commander's instruction, you beam down to the planet's surface. Using communicators, you, your ship, and the dark villains focus your transmatters and synchronize timings. Logging into computers, you set the time for simultaneous beamings. At the set time, both transmatter beams focus on you and your body dematerializes. Moments later, you appear in the Traveler's Transmatter Unit, in your own body. The experiment has been a success. You contact the commander, who reports that his own officer has likewise reappeared in his Transmatter Unit. You congratulate each other, then you decide to continue on your journey. That was a heck of a first contact. Leave orbit and continue... onwards, indeed. You leave orbit and increase speed. So, we head for a large gray planet, or search for an alternative destination. And we'll decide that in the next episode, guys. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you liked the video, go ahead and click like down below. Subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment. That'd be a big help. And we'll see you next time. Later days, everyone.